This episode of the Better Two podcast is brought to you by Kitty Mystic and DM Needham, author of the Better to Burn Out series, which includes her latest releases of Fairy Tales and I Love You and Is Love Just Another High. Hey, Donna from the Better Two podcast here. If you've listened to my show, you know that it always sounds great. That's thanks to the guys at 30 Year Audio Productions. 30 Year Audio helps podcasters, broadcasters, musicians, and business owners get their important messages out to their audience. Rich and the 30 Year Audio team are easy to work with. They're efficient and understand that your message is important to you. With quick turnaround and the true caring of your needs, 30 Year Audio is your go to for any audio message. Reach out to 30 Year Audio at 312 388 5596. Rich and his team will deliver for you. That's 312 388 5596. Or you could email them at info at 30 year audio.com or visit them on the web at www.30yearaudio.com. Hi, gang. Welcome to the Better Two podcast. I'm your host, Donna. Today, I have the pleasure of sitting down with Rob Mabry. We talk about his movie, The Legend of El Chupacabra. And we talk about filmmaking and the whole process. So stay tuned. So hi, Rob. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Good. So you are a director, but this was something that was a lifelong dream. And it's not that you're just a director. You're a writer, director, producer. You're kind of a... A, a triple threat and you did allow me to watch your movie and i want to say this because i have had another indie director on and your production quality because i also had a television background for a bit um was superb and i applaud you Thank for you that there was no sound problems everything was crisp everything was clear and so from a technical aspect and i'm not going to say anything else right now from a technical okay. aspect it was very good and it wasn't because I worked on a low budget TV show back in the late 90s, early 2000s. So I know yeah. about camera looking really shoddy. This looks like a real deal, like a real cinematic movie. Yeah, I was fortunate to work with a lot of talented people um, and, you know, um, equipment matters, right? Like, you know, we shot on a red uh, camera, which, you know, it, it is a Hollywood level camera, um, you know, put that in, in the capable hands of, of our DP, Chris Martin. And, uh, yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, I felt like it, you know, is when you tell somebody you've made an indie film, you know, and it's like, Hey, watch it. I think for a lot of people, it's kind of like, Ooh, what am I getting myself into? Um, but, uh, yeah, from, from a technical standpoint, I think the film holds up to a lot of things that you would see in, in theaters or on streaming. I agree. And I understand where you're coming from because I'm an indie author and I've had people, you know, Ooh, you're an indie author, but I have a book out that I have gotten the compliment of, I went to sit down for a few minutes to read the book. And next thing I knew it was dinner time that I couldn't put the book down. So when you get a compliment, just like the technical aspect, even though, you wrote it and everything. There's still that technical component that you want the whole package to look good, as well as the actual movie itself, as far as the script and the characters and everything else. Yeah, for sure. And and sound is such a huge thing, you know, like, and, and sound is really hard to get right. And I'll admit that, you know, when I'm, when I'm on set, I'm probably thinking 80%, what is it going to look like? And hopefully 20%, you know, what is that sound going to be like? Um, and so uh, some people had to work some wizardry you know, <laughs> to, to get us to where we, we needed to be in terms of sound. But, you know, you can you can watch a terrible video. And as, if you can hear what's going on, right, you can follow the story and, and you'll go along with it. Um, you can have the most beautiful shots in the world. But if you can't hear the audio or understand it, you're not going to keep watching it. So no, it sounds important. No, because that's the thing. I mean, yes, we can do subtitles, but then if you're reading subtitles, you're look, you're missing the visual. Yeah. Yeah. And, and subtitles are great. I don't, I'm not knocking them, but you want to see the visual too. And sometimes there's a movie I'm, you may re recall it. It's a Jennifer Lopez movie, the cell. The cell is a beautifully shot yeah, movie, yeah, yeah. beautifully shot movie. The movie's a crap. Yeah. It's totally piece of crap, <laughs> but visually stunning, yes. Yeah. And and I think that's important. So I applaud you for that. So when we talk about this, this we have to go back to 
what, when you were eight years old and you finally started going, you got the bug because you were helping your dad work on film projects or home movie projects? Yeah, my dad, you know, he uh, always had uh, an eight millimeter camera and eventually was a super eight camera. But, you know, um, he, he was the guy who made the home movies, but um, he would actually add titles, you know, title sequences to the home movies. And um, he had a little eight millimeter editing bay and he would edit, you know, the film, uh, film footage together. And so I became very fascinated by that process, you know, from a pretty young age. Um, And, you know, my my dad could be a grumpy guy, um, but that was a way for us to bond. And when he was feeling particularly generous, um, he would let me use the camera and you know, film the things that I, I wanted to to film as a kid, which was just, you know, stupid stuff with my friends, but definitely kind of set me on the journey. What set you on the writing journey? Because, I mean, I know you can say sometimes that it all goes hand in hand, but for some people, it's not that case. So what made you decide also to become a writer at this point? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, y- you know, I making people laugh was an important thing to me. And so, you know, most of the writing and the stories that I did, like I would write my own comic books and, um, but it was always, you know, to, to get a laugh. And, uh, and again, I think that probably, you know, stems from my dad. Um, he could be a very funny guy. Um, and, you know, I knew I could get on his good side. Um, if I could make him laugh. And so I think that was, you know, part of the motivation for me. Um, And I just like telling stories and, uh, you know, writing, writing is a way to, to accomplish that. And uh, so, you know, for me, I I think that's, you know, that's a big part of it. Um, You know, trying, trying to uh, entertain people and make them laugh. I do have a question and I know it's a kind of an awkward question because you and I are around the same age. Is your dad still around and has he seen this? No, unfortunately, he, he passed uh, before he was able to to see the feature film. Um, you know, he saw some of the shorts um, that I was doing. I don't I don't know. You know, it was pretty early in my my filmmaking journey. Um, and so I don't uh, I, I, I don't know that, you know, it was the uh, best stuff that I did. Um, but. You know, that that is something that my, you know, siblings, um, my kids, you know, say my parents would have been very, very proud of the film that I made. And and they knew, you know, that that was something that I always wanted to do. Well, and I know you had the military background and I understand, you know, in your bio, you talk about the fact that it really did not go along with your creativity. And I can understand that because it is very regimen. My, my stepfather, because I wanted to be a bass player when I was high school. He would be like, you need to join the military, get some backbone in you. And I'm just like, dude, I, and yeah. I, I'm creative. I, this is not what I want to do. And so I, I I understand when when I read that in your bio, I was like, well, I get that. Because it's, it, it's, <laughs> it's very opposing to who you are at your core. Yeah. Well, I was very much uh, at a point, you know, this was like you know, probably ni- 19 years old, um, failed out of college you know, just was directionless, like did not have my shit together, you know, in any way. And my parents were like, look, (laughs) you know, you need to get it together. And so, you know, I I didn't have a ton of options. Um, And so, you know, they kind of pushed me in that direction. Now they wanted me to go into the Air Force. So I was like, oh, Air Force, I'm going into the Army. And, uh, you know, I, I, I took a bunch of the, you know, the tests, uh, military tests, the ASVAB, and there's something called the D-LAB, um, which is a de- defense language aptitude battery. My dad was a linguist and he really wanted me, you know, to follow in his footsteps, which would have been, you know, smart. Um, you know, the military will train you for a year in Monterey, California, which is not bad. Um, and, you know, so- sounded all right, but, you know, because it was my parents telling me you know, this is what you should do. I was like, no, I'm going to do something different. Um, and uh, so I I chose journalism and I, I didn't regret that decision in any way, but you know, I was just a much better journalist than I ever was a soldier. 
but isn't isn't that the gen x way kind of going yeah you want me to do that no i'm not doing that you don't know what you're talking about i'm doing what i want to do yeah yeah exactly you know i i i had that independent streak but didn't have a ton of options either so um it it all worked out in the end but you know i wasn't somebody who was going to go and have a 20-year career in the military and, and retire um i was fortunate to make it as long as i did so growing up were you a horror buff or was that just something you I, I was a movie buff you know like when i was a little kid i i lived on a military base i lived in in germany um in a, a town called bad eibling south of, of munich in Bavaria, you know, beautiful, beautiful countryside. Um, but on this military base, there was a theater like just about any military base, and they'd have a Sunday matinee. And my mom would give me a dollar and she would send me on my own, um, you know, probably uh, often with my younger sister in tow. And we would go and we would watch, you know, uh, all, all the Disney movies of the 70s, Herbie the Love Bug and you know, super dad. And, you know, I remember seeing Willy Wonka um, as, as a kid there in that theater, but, you know, that was sort of my, you know, escape, um, but also just a treat, you yeah. know, and like every weekend I would, I would go in, and see a movie. So I just, you know, had a love for being in a theater and, you know, sitting there and watching a movie on the big screen. Um, and so I think that had a, a lot to do, you know, with it. And then, you know, I, I grew up in a time when, you know, we, we had Jason and Freddy, you know, and so many great slasher films and um, not, not your thing, I take it. I, I like it. I like comedy of it. I, I like when it's, it has comedy to it. My, <laughs> I had roommates. Okay. I never saw Nightmare on Elm Street and I had moved out for my mom and, and I'm I'm living with my two roommates, and I come home from work, and I was working at Chuck E. Cheese. Ooh, so I, <laughs> I um this is when it was cool though. We had the video games, so it was still yeah. cool. So I come home, they pick me up, and and they're like, "We're gonna watch this." It was on HBO, and I'm like, "No, we're not." Oh yes, we are. So they sat on either side of me, and they held my hands because I was always doing this. I mean, I would go to the theater. We went and saw The Fly at the theater, and I either turned around and had my hands like this. No, I don't like this stuff. I yeah. if it's got comedy, fine. So anyway, because you'll appreciate this. So what they did to me after we watched this, then they went into the kitchen and they taped knives to their fingers. <laughs> and I had a bedroom door that had slats on it. And they were like running it against the slats saying, oh, Freddie's no. coming to get you. Yeah. And chased me around the house with knives on their fingers. Yeah. And so, mm, yeah. But I mean, I love, I love the movie house and the original Fright Night was awesome. So, I mean, if it had a little bit of fun to it, I was okay, but it, yeah. and I mean, flatliners I like, but it was still, it's not your hardcore, uh, poltergeist. And it's interesting how setting outside, I think can affect you. My mom took me to see poltergeist at the theater and it was hard for me to watch. And the, I was scared. And the worst scene all was the, the face, the infamous face peeling. So then I yeah. watched it broad daylight at my uncle's house. The only thing that bothered me was the face peeling. Then yeah. I went to my dad's house the, that night and he had the windows open and they had trees all around the house and it started storming. And even though I <laughs> saw the movie that morning, I could not watch it that night because yeah. I, you're, you're now you have the trees rattling against the window, which is just like in the movie. So well, that's a really scary one, you know, for, for a, a kid because it involves kids, you know, and, and Carol Ann is the one who gets trapped and, yeah, so I, I can understand how that one would get I mean, you. I mean, I was in eighth grade at that point, so I wasn't supposed to be the scaredy cat, but I think what happened is when I was about four or five, my parents were in my bedroom and I had a little black and white TV, and they were watching Alfred Hitchcock's out, you know, Hour or whatever. And all I remember, I still remember it to this day, of a skeleton sitting up in a coffin. And that did it for me. After that, <laughs> I've always just been terrified of a of. Mm, the the crypt keeper maybe yeah could, well could it wasn't but it wasn't it was it was it wasn't the crypt keeper at the time it was okay. just some kind of i don't even remember because i was too little all i remember is seeing that and it was just like mm -mm. so yeah, my, my parents when i was you know probably four or five years old you know they they would you know sit me on the couch with them and and watch you know whatever uh scary movie was on tv and uh, and there was one where uh, you know there were these ghosts who who 
were saying to the characters, we want you. We want you. Oh. And so my my parents, <laughs> you know, put me to bed and then stand outside of my door. Robbie, we want no, you. No, 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 no. Like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> I, I mean, when we went to the Haunted Mansion in Disney World, because we went when the first up we used to go, I, I was terrified, especially when the ghost would sit in, on you in the car. It was just like, no, don't. It was like they love to terrorize their little daughter. I, I don't know why. Even, yeah. even if we went to pose with a character, my dad's like, yeah, you're gonna get tiger tigeritis. You're gonna get sleepy itis. I'm like, <laughs> there was never, never anything normal, I guess. Um, yeah, but yeah, it's fu- it's funny how you know some people completely em- embrace it and love horror, and and you know uh, other uh, people just you know <laughs> don't want to have anything to do. With it. One of my friends wanted to go see Blair Witch um, at a midnight showing when it first opened, and I'm like, no, 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 no. Finally, I acquiesced and went with her. And I remember sitting there, most of the movie like this, and the only thing I remember was the eyes, just seeing the eyes. But I will say this, the psychological aspect, because you never do see anything in that movie. You never, because I'm watching it through my hands, but the psychological aspect of it is what gets you. That's what messes with your head. It's, uh, you know, was was a brilliant film. um, And also the, the marketing campaign for that film, you know, they sort of built the whole lore um, of, of the witch and, um, had, you know, had a, had a website that, you know, people were reading the stories about the Blair Witch and, uh, yeah, very, very clever how they marketed that film. But let's talk about another movie, The Legend of El Chupacabra. Sure, would love to. Where did you, where, okay, so what made you decide out of everything that, let's do the Chupacabra? Um... You know, there are a couple of things. It, for one, um, it was really important me, uh, to me to tell a Texas story. Um, so I've lived here in Texas for 30 years. I was born here. Um, and uh, so I wanted to to do something that was Texan um, and, and shoot it with a Texas cast and, and a Texas crew. Um, so that was in my mind, you know, when I made a, a decision to make the feature film. Um, it actually started as a, a short film. Um, so it was about f- 15 pages, I think. And um, it, it uh, the idea sort of spawned out of some of uh, the cast that I had worked with before. And so, you know, I was sort of developing the ideas. Uh, there's a, an actor named uh, Sam Pierce. He pay, plays the nerdy hero um, in the film. And um, then Jared Donnelly, uh, he plays Sturgis Preston, who's kind of the um, villain. Um, and uh, so there were a couple of actors that I wanted to write parts for. Um, and, you know, I honestly can't say like, how, how did I pick the yeah. Chupacabra? I really don't remember. Um, but, you know, I had this, this idea about this grifter who kind of comes into town and um, fleeces the town uh, of their money because he's going to, you know, uh, find the Chupacabra, right? And he needs money for his expedition. So that, that was the uh, first incarnation of the story. And then as I went to, you know, to write the feature length film, um, I wrote something that was, probably, uh, you know, along the lines of Stranger Things. Um, So a sort of, you know, sci-fi with some elements of comedy, but it was a pretty straight, you know, sort of science fiction horror thing. Um, And it's important to me when I write to get feedback from people. So I solicited a lot of feedback and I used some peer review sites. And um, so I got a lot of feedback. And the thing that kept coming back um, in terms of that feedback was, hey, the best thing about this is the comedy. Like, you know, it's fairly conventional in terms of the story. But, you know, the things where you really are leaning into the comedy, that's where it's really working. Um, and so I thought, you know, about all of the films that I've done and, you know, it was 15, 20 short films and probably 80% of them are comedies. And I was like, man, they're right. What am I doing? You know, yeah. if, I, if I'm going to make my first feature film, I, I should do the thing that I'm really what I think the best at. 
um, and that's comedy. And so, um, you know, a couple couple more rewrites, and I, I polished it, and and really just focused on you know the comedy and 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 the characters, and and making sure that the story you know works, and and that you care about it, and you care about the characters, um, but hopefully. Um, you know, there's uh, laughs to be had. There are. There are laughs to be had. And the so far, the character redeemed himself. So I, I would give you kudos for that one because, you know, at first you're kind of like, this dude's a little smarmy. Um, and he still stays <laughs> smarmy, but you do redeem him. So, I mean, there there's, there's yeah, good things there. He's pretty horrible. Yeah, yeah. So, but, um, you know, that's, that's, so that's the character of Roy Dixon and he's my favorite character in the film. I think a lot of people um, sort of connect with that character because I think a lot of us know that character who's, you know, just not politically correct and crass and, you know, misguided in, in so many ways you know, but can also have a heart of gold, right? And have good intentions. And I've known so many people like that, um, you know, throughout my life. And so I think that was a big part of of how that character came to be. What made you decide to time this Jupacabra to come out during the election cycle? Um, well, it, you know, people who believe in the Chupacabra uh, are also, I think, prone to um, conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I felt like it made sense to have that element. Um, I, uh, I, for better or worse, I think I'm a political junkie and, um, you know, it, uh, it matters to me, like the direction of our country. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to sort of play with that. And, and I wanted to have, you know, sort of a shadowy shadow government, you know, group of global elites, um, you know, play a part in, in the story. Um, and so, yeah, set, setting it around the, the election cycle. And, and, and that also helped, you know, these kids have this experience with the Chupacabra as kids mm -hmm. and they're, you know, needed to be something to keep the, the main character, um, you know, kind of connected to the Chupacabra. And so having um, these sightings and, and, you know, killings happen on a four year cycle um, with the uh, tied to the election um, made sense to me. It made sense. I'm, I'm not, I'm not faulting you. I just, it was, it was definitely noticeable. And I noticed, yes, right off the bat, you started off with the, the round table conspiracy, you know, the, the, the global yeah. elites. And I mean, it wasn't lost on me at all. Um, that, that's good to hear because sometimes um, it, it's hard to tell, like, you know, you want to drop in enough for people to be able to connect the dots, you know, but you don't want to hammer them over the head with something like that either. So um, it's, I, I like to hear that, you know, you, you, caught you got that right but you see okay i'm not the average i'm not the average movie watcher because i will sit there and analyze i like a movie that's gonna make me think so when you when you put something in like that and i have to put pieces together that that makes me happy because it's like watching Excellent. the matrix okay the first time i watched the <laughs> matrix i sat there not the other one just the first one i sat there yeah. afterwards going so is everything here real <laughs> I mean, you know, you know it is, but is it? <laughs> is it? Just one of those things. So it's like when a movie makes you think and it's not predictable, especially as a writer, and I'm sure because you've written things, it you you when you watch things, it becomes predictable for you. You can yes. figure things yes. out and you're like, okay. And, and my husband, he used to be like, how do you know that? And it's like, because this, this, and this. He couldn't yeah, understand yeah. it. But when you train your mind as a writer, you start figuring all the stuff out beforehand and things lose their spark. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, it, it's easy. It, it, it's easy to, to, you know, kind of pick it all apart, right? And see all the pieces coming together. Um, and, and it's hard to uh, try to convince yourself not to overanalyze, you know, things mm -hmm. and just enjoy the ride. The, the the gentleman who and I I'm I didn't I'm awful with names in real life so leave, learning characters names is 
not the best for me either. But uh, when I look at the character who was coming to rescue the town, it's like I felt like he was Antonio Banderas and Crocodile Dundee rolled into one. <laughs> Uh, that's Jared Donnelly. He will, he will love to hear that. <laughs> it just kind of felt like, you know, because he had the whole Antonio Banderas with the ponytail and everything. And then the head, yeah. it was just the whole demeanor of, yeah, I'm so suave. And I got the, yeah, okay, dude. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah. A- another sort of touch point, like when we were discussing the character, um, Ben Stiller's character from Dodgeball mm-hmm. was another, you know, just... I I wouldn't say inspiration, but like when we talked about it, it's like, oh, we're going for this vibe, this guy who's, you know, just a complete narcissist and and totally oblivious, you know, to to what's going on. And he was. (laughs) (laughs) He was. So for you, okay, this was a labor of love and you, you know, you've had many incarnations of what you were creating. And finally, when you get to the moment where you're shooting it, you're putting it all together you have to come up with the financial backing and you said you know in your doc in your bio it's it's about crowdfunding and family and friends and your own money and how did you you know how did you actually get all this together because i mean i remember working on the tv show which is crazy um i we had a woman whose husband was quite wealthy and she handed me a checkbook of two hundred thousand dollars and she said here we need to film six episodes of the tv show Okay, I don't know what the hell I'm doing, but okay, sure, <laughs> uh, fast education, and I did, but so how yeah. did you come up with that? Because this isn't the same scenario as that. Yeah, um, man, it's it's hard out there for an indie filmmaker. Um, for, for me, like this was a bucket list item, right? Like, you know, I, I just re- reached a point where um, I, felt like now is the time, you know, for me to, to live the dream and make a feature film. Um, you know, I made 15, 20 shorts beforehand. And so I really learned the craft of filmmaking. Um, I work in technology. And um, so, you know, for the last 20, 25 years, um, I've been managing people and managing projects. And, you know, so, I, I think I leveraged that, you know, ability, right, to really put structure around, you know, this this anything. Like we weren't, you know, just going out there with our cameras and trying right. to shoot stuff, right? Like there was a lot of logistics and planning, you know, that had to take place. And you know, you don't really think about it, but you know, if you're if you're making a film. You know, you have to break down everything in the script and they call it a script breakdown, right? But you need to figure out what are all the costumes that I need? What are all the props that I'm going to need, right? Like, oh, we're shooting in, you know, in scenes in this location at night three times, you know, so that's a, a shoot day, right? Like mm-hmm. you've got to logistically plan everything to be as efficient as you possibly can. And and, you know, there were times when when we failed and we didn't make our day, you know, which is we didn't get all the footage that we needed to shoot. Um, you know, one one day in particular was uh, we had planned very aggressively and things didn't go according to plan and we had to come back and essentially reshoot um, that day. That was probably the worst. Um, but a- anyway, I, I hope I've answered your question, but you I did. think a, a lot of just my professional experience um, and and also, you know, being, uh, you know, uh, a Gen Xer, right? Um, I've got some life experience, too, yeah. you know, and and so, and I put my own money in it, in, into it, um, and, and other people's, you know, people I care about um, who believed in me, um, so I didn't want to screw it up, basically. And so now you have, a, you have, it's on DVD, but you have a streaming deal. So um, I have a distribution deal and the distributor is working to get it out on streaming. Um, that has been a slower process than uh, I, I would like. Um, there are a lot of indie filmmakers out there making movies and um, trying to get them on platforms like Tubi. Um, I was actually talking with the distributor last week and they told me, be patient. Um, Tubi is getting a thousand movies a day a day 
um, and they can process and onboard like 40 of them. Um, so that just gives you an idea of what the competition is out there. I get it. Yeah. And, and, you know, some, something needs to change. I, I do feel like I'm releasing this indie film, uh, possibly at the worst possible time for an indie filmmaker, because there's so much competition out there. Um, but it is my hope that the quality of the movie um, will help it to rise above, you know, the other stuff that's just out there. I would agree. I mean, that's the thing. That's why I, the first thing I opened with was the quality because I have talked to other people and the sound was off or the shot was, it was not as high quality. And sometimes the quality matters so much more that it stands out more. Have you submitted the film to, you know, festivals? I have submitted the film to one film festival um, and we'll, we'll see what happens. It, it, it's, you know, the, the horses kind of left the gate, I think is. Yeah, I get it. Metaphor, you, you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's out there, right? A lot of people plot a strategy of, Hey, I'm going to get the film into a bunch of festivals. You know, we'll, we'll get the laurels from the festivals. We'll show it on the trailer um, and that's, you know, what's what's going to make the film popular. I, I don't think that's a, um, a realistic strategy anymore. I don't begrudge anybody who, who puts their film in a film festival. But, you know, for, for my film, like, it's very much entertainment. It's, you know, intended to make people laugh. Whether it, you know, won an award at a film festival, Listen. I don't think the audience gives a shit about that. And so, um, and, and it's expensive to enter film festivals, oh, yeah. right? Like it's, you know, $50, $100 per festival and you're only going to get into maybe 10, 15, like that investment, it, it's just not worth it to me. So it's not anything that I pursued. Um, but, uh, you know, if I could get into the Austin Film Festival, um, you know, it's a well-regarded festival that I could drive up from San Antonio and attend and, and be a part of it. And that would be cool. What about South by Southwest? I, I would love it, but I know, you know that's... Comp competition for South by Southwest and, and just the timing wasn't right too. like, yeah. you know, that's another thing you've got, you know, you've got a window, right. To submit your film and, and that window didn't work out. Yeah. When, when I did the TV show it was back in 98 and we did get the six episodes produced. And then we went down to uh, the national television producers and executives thing and just going there to have representation there it was three of us that went and our entry fee alone and this is 98 so you know it was a lot cheaper it was close to i think three thousand dollars and that's not counting room board hiring the model to walk around um yeah. it, it was just it was a lot of expense and did we get picked up no but that's the thing it's like people don't understand and that was way before we had the expanse of streaming and everything else. So it's like, I understand the competition level because that's why you have people on Spotify and on KDP getting peanuts or pennies, less than a penny for page reads or, or plays. And it's the same thing that's eventually going to unfortunately most likely happen in the movie industry as well. Well, it's already there. Like Amazon pays, uh, you know, so something around a penny an hour viewed wow for, for a, a film right like nobody no indie filmmaker expects to make um you know I anything off of amazon um tubi is the place uh because it's advertising uh video on demand um and that you know they pay a decent uh ad revenue um for your film that's where uh, indie filmmakers are tend tending to make their money right now but now Tubi is getting overwhelmed with this, you know, indie content. They can't even curate it, right? Um, and so, you know, they probably will will become another Netflix where they start to produce their own content and only their own own content. And indie filmmakers will be, you know, looking somewhere else um, to to try to make a buck. So. Um, yeah, I don't want to be, you know, um, negative or discouraging, you know, to filmmakers. Um, you know, I feel like 
I made my movie, uh, you know, regardless of whether I was going to make a dime or not, you know, I had that bucket list item and I wanted to make, you know, the best movie that I possibly could. And so um, I invested in myself to do that. But as I look at my next, you know, film, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I can't just keep going in the hole, you know, right. every time I make a movie, like, how am I going to make back my money on the movie? And it has made me um, change my thinking. Like, you know, I, ha I have a sequel in mind for Chupacabra. It's not a direct sequel. Like the idea is um, a story set in the same town of Bluffkin, largely the same cast um, and a comedy uh, about alien invasion so you know a little a, a little different i'm doing like you know stephen king has dairy right mm -hmm. and he sets a lot of his stories in dairy so bluffkin is is my dairy and and i want to do this alien invasion story but that takes a pretty big budget right to do something like that so i'm thinking uh you know for uh my next project it'll be something on a smaller scale um, i've got a sort of horror mockumentary uh idea that i'm excited about um, but anyway, you know, you can't just keep going and making big budget films. Um, you've, you've really got to think about how you're going to get your money back. Well, and I was going to say, unless you're, you know, for aliens, unless you're going to do the Ed Wood style, um, it is going to be expensive. Although that being said, computer animation nowadays is, is great. And, and I kind of, there was something that popped in my head a little while ago when you were talking and. The whole fact of AI and deep fakes, because you were talking about the political realm and you're a political junkie. How do you feel about AI in the filmmaking process? That's a great question. Um, uh, used properly, it's a great tool, and you know, I I have I didn't use AI on Chupacabra, but you know, for some things related to filmmaking. Um, I, I definitely make use of AI. Um, I don't think that it will replace, you know, filmmakers. Yes, you know, there probably will be, you know, AI generated um, films someday. But I think people sort of yearn for human stories and they want it to be authentic. And so um, I think AI will have a place in filmmaking. And, you know, every filmmaker should start to understand how they can leverage that, you know, technology. Um, I, I can see, you know, from a visual effects standpoint, that there are things that I can do today that even a year ago, I would not be able to do. Oh, right. Yeah. So um, learn to use the tool, um, you know, but, but I wouldn't be... Uh, overly concerned that it's going to completely replace, you know, filmmakers. I just don't think that will. Well, happen. I mean, and when you look at older older films, I mean, there's certain films that hold up still, and then there's certain films that the special effects just do not hold up. And we'll, we'll go for old school. Clash of the Titans, the original Clash of the Titans back in the day, yeah. and Jason and the Argonauts. Those weren't meant to hold up to the standards of today because they were shot completely different. But then there's a scene, oh, and one of the first trilogy of star wars movies uh i can't remember which one but anakin is riding around on this creature and he's being thrown around and the cgi is so bad it's also like the mummy returns uh with the rock being the scorpion king it's so badly done or blade where it, they, they just don't hold up yeah and I think we've gotten better than that, but still some of the, the effects, it's like the Jason and the Argonaut stuff and those hold up better in, in Clash of the Titans than the CGI at times. Yeah, well, um, I don't want to go on a rant okay. um, and I love Marvel movies and superhero mm -hmm. movies, but I think it's gotten to a point where you know, when 90% of what you're looking at on screen is a visual effect, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it just becomes this sort of muddy, colorful mess and uh, takes me out of the the story, you know, and, and that's not true of, you know, of everything that Marvel is doing, but I just think that they have become so reliant on, you know, everything being a visual effect. 
um, that uh, they've lost uh, you know a lot of, of the charm of, of the film. So um, yeah, a bit too much. Well, and that's the thing you you need that you need to be able to tell a story, and it doesn't have to be you. Ha- going back to you need the human element. You don't necessarily need all the big guns and all the big blazes because we want to hear that we want that human connection. That's what we really want to see. And that's what we really want to be part of. Um, you know, when I look at the one Thor movie I love, and I will, I still love it to this day, is Ragnarok. And the opening of Ragnarok, where he is chained up and he's spinning around, and yes, there's some CGI, but just him being chained up and in that moment of him turning around, like, wait a second, I'll be right back around. There's a humanity in there, <laughs> there's comedy in there, but there was a yeah. realness. And that's the thing. It's like, you didn't have you could have taken everything out and just had him going around and we got it because that was real yep so out of any kind of what was your favorite horror movie ever what's your favorite oh wow um of all time i would probably say the exorcist Okay. Um, yeah, <laughs> my my parents again uh, allowed me to see that at a very young age, and it absolutely terrorized me. And so it was a long time before I went back to watch it again. Um, but uh, yeah, just very creepy, unsettling. Um, you know, I think if you asked me this question tomorrow, like I would have a different answer. Um, but, but, you know, that right now, and I, you know, you were saying you're not a horror fan. Um, I really, really liked, uh, X, which is Ty West, uh, with Mia Goth. Um, and then the sequel to that was Pearl. Um, and then uh, there's a, a, a third film in the trilogy called Maxine. Um, I, I just thought th- they're horror films, but they're also great stories, incredibly well acted. Um, and um, so, you know, for recent films, um, those are, are some that I would recommend. I see. I like Zombieland. I like Shaun of the Dead. So see, it, what, your movie was fine for me to watch because yeah. I like that aspect. I like it. It's funny. But Shaun of the Dead is probably my favorite horror comedy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, Ed, Ed, Edgar Wright is a brilliant filmmaker and um, that was, you know, one, one of his early films and it's just hilariously funny mm-hmm. and has a great story and yeah, it's and a it's brilliant cast top-notch. and a brilliant cast. And I mean, everything yeah. worked. Zombie Land worked for certain aspects, and I think like Woody Harrelson with the Twinkies. The the whole there was a whole thing that he needed those Twinkies. But my yeah. my my late husband he loved Walking Dead, and I'd be like, okay, I'm going upstairs to write. You can stay down here and watch this. I'm not. Mm-mm. Nope. Sorry. So yeah, I, I, just, I watched every episode of of Walking Dead and uh, and Fear the Walking Dead. Uh, yeah. Z Nation. Nah. See nah, that that was kind of a, a comedy. It had its moments of comedy. Yeah, I don't know. It didn't leave a big impression on me. I didn't for, like. For I said that reason. wasn't my thing. That was his thing. So, yeah. if you, how did you? You know, when you pitch this to the cast, since you've worked with some of them before, were they all like, okay, yeah, this sounds cool, or were they just kind of like, what are we doing? Uh, they were like, when do we start? Awesome. I mean, a- actors love to be able to practice their craft. And, um, you know, they they know what I'm about, you know, and, and they know what the experience is going to be like when they're on set, um, you know, which, try. well, I won't say try. Uh, you got to feed people, right? You've got to make them as comfortable as you possibly can. Um, and, you know, people will follow you a long way if if they feel like uh, you're taking care of them. So, you know, I think, you know, for anybody who'd worked with me before, like they understood what the experience was going to be. And so they were just like, yeah, I'm all in. Let's go. 
<laughs> well, and, and I mean, they trust you. If they've worked with you before, you've built that reputation and there's trust. And I think that's what a lot of people don't discuss as far as the creative process. You have to trust the people you're working with. You have to have a certain level of comfort because if you don't, there's an inauthentic feel to it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and that was, you know, I think part, part of the reason that the movie works is um, because I'd worked with so many of those people, like I wrote to their strengths. I understood, you know, uh, how, how to get the best, you know, out of them in, in terms of their performance and really give them, you know, something that they were going to be excited about. Um, so that was a big advantage just in, in terms of, you know, writing something that I knew was going to work. And the one thing I think that you did well was you gave every character a stake here. They each had a stake in this. Even the one that seemed against it all still had a stake in this eventually. And that's that brought everybody together in the final outcome. And that's that's important. That's where you want, you know, you want the hero hero to win. You want the the team to win. And I think you did that. I think you achieved that. And you have well, thank you. I really I appreciate that. And um, yeah, story matters, right? Um, you can't just string a br bunch of jokes together and you know think that the audience is going to be entertained. Um, and you know, I talked a, a bit about the writing process, but the film probably went through 25 drafts, um, you know, po polishing various aspects of it, always trying to make it better, you know, to make sure that the story is cohesive, you know, that, um, you know, it sort of follows that hero's journey. Um, I, I believe in, I think structure is really important. Um, and, you know, there are some, some methodologies uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Save the Cat, but Save the Cat is a popular screenwriting book. Um, and Save the Cat is, you know, the title is about, you know, making your hero likable, right? So you have them save the cat and, and then the audience will like them. But um, anyway, that's a popular screenwriting structure. I kind of layer those things, you know, over my script and and just assess, you know, how well that story is, is working. But... Um, you know, once you get on set, you can't rewrite the film. Not that that, you know, hasn't happened. Yeah, right? yeah. But, but as an indie filmmaker, you don't, you don't want to be it. out there rewriting your, you know, film in the middle of shooting. So it's really important that you, you know, get the, spend, spend the time on that story. Like, don't get so excited that you're just going to rush out, you know, and film something that's half-baked. Get feedback from people. You know, and make sure that um, the story is the best that it could possibly be. And one thing that we didn't talk about, and I don't know that you subscribe to this or prescribe to it, would be the the Bible. The care. I mean, for me, I have character Bibles, and I think that's because I worked on the television show. It's like I have I have everything I need to have for a character. I have their their old car. I have their their map where their house was. I have pictures of their house. I have I even their astrological chart i go hardcore and put all this together because that is for me if i need reference or something to inspire me and i know we worked on the tv show we had all these locales we had everything laid out plus the script and i think that's something that some people don't really think about how much work goes into it just beside that little script like you were saying you have to storyboard everything you have to make your sets you know you did you have to pull uh permits because nobody really talks about pulling permits. You have to, you have to get all the equipment. Like if for the diner scene, if you already have a diner set up, awesome. But like we had to set stages for the the kitchen that we were using, so we had to go out and buy equipment. So there's so much that goes into production that I don't think anybody talks about. It's crazy. Like, why would anybody put themselves through it? <laughs> I really, I really did wonder that. Quite frequently, um, you know, as I was loading up gear, in, you know, into my car at five o'clock in the morning, you know, knowing that I wasn't coming home probably till three o'clock in the morning the next day. Um, like it takes a crazy amount of dedication. Um, and and yes, like, you know, all of those things, it's incredibly complicated. So many things can go wrong. But that experience of being on set with people and making a movie, there is nothing else like it. 
and you know as hard as it is just about to a person um they would not want to be anywhere else you know than on that set making a movie because it it is a special experience i i don't know what it is um because it's so much work um but i think you know you you know like a, a, everybody gets that opportunity um, to do the thing that they absolutely love and and have that experience. And uh, so, yeah, it's a special thing. I often joke that it was the best summer job I had. We did it for three months. And I was the line producer and the caterer and the script supervisor and 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 the next year. I mean, yeah. it's like I had all these roles and I was on, going 24-7. And I remember the, the, the cast and the crew is like, okay. Now that we're wrap production, we're all going camping. And I just looked at them like, you go camping. I'm going home to sleep. I ended up sick <laughs> as a dog. We all got sick because we were all going. Yeah. But you know what? When people ask me about that experience, I'm like, it's the best summer job I ever had. Yeah. Because even though you're working your ass off, there's still just this empowerment to it that you're creating something from nothing. Yes. And you love each other like a family mm -hmm. you know and and get very close to people mm -hmm. and, and and then it's like poof yeah it's gone i know you know yeah i mean yeah. you build this relationship and you're like okay we're all gonna stay together and we're all gonna do this and that lasts usually maybe five six months and then slowly it kind of fades away and then you run across them and talk to them again but yeah it's it's that camaraderie and that feeling and it's just there's so much positive energy even on your worst days when things go to go to hell you still have the other people supporting you saying we're going to get through absolutely yeah so when do you when do you think you might get it on some streaming platforms boy um that's a great question i am hoping by july Okay. that the film might be out there and available. Um, I will definitely let you know. Um, so you can let your audience know. Um, but who knows? Who knows? But it is on DVD. It is on DVD. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it at walmart.com um, and many other fine online retailers. Um, yeah, it's funny. This streaming thing it's it's just the last thing, you know? Like, I've written the movie, I shot the movie, edited it, you know, mm -hmm. had a premiere, got it on the DVD, and now I'm just, you know, waiting to get it out on on uh, on streaming platforms, and it's just the last bit of, of the mile. So what was it like to have your premiere? Oh, it was amazing. There, there's nothing like sitting in a theater um, with an audience and, you know, listening to them laugh at the jokes that you've, you know, written, that you, you know, uh, filmed with a, your cast. Um, and, you know, just to get that feedback and to know like, oh, you know, when I wrote that joke, um, you know, it, it worked. Um, I, I don't know, that's just like a really, really special experience. Um, so it was absolutely fantastic. And it was, you know, uh, we we did it at a, an independent theater, city-based cinemas in San Antonio. Um, and we had the red carpet and, you know, photographers and yeah, everybody was dressed, um, you know, to the nines. And uh, so it was really, really a cool thing. Um, we had another uh, premiere in Austin um, because the cast and crew kind of came from San, San Antonio, Austin. Um, and so... Uh, uh, a couple of, of weeks ago, uh, we had the Austin premiere as well, and that was super cool too. I can imagine. I'll never get tired of of sitting in an audience and and watching the movie and and listening to people laugh. Like you know, that's the best thing in the world. Oh yeah, I mean it, it's it's the compliment to your what you've created. Precisely. And I, that there's a big thing because we've talked about that I'm an author. There's a big thing that, you know, reviews are for readers. They're not for authors. But the fact of the matter is when you're creating something and you want you want to connect with somebody emotionally, you want to read that review. Because even if it's I have one review on my first book um, 
I, this guy is vile. I admit that. I got a five-star review. The guy was vile. Okay, whatever. But I had this one woman write. No, I was happy. I mean, it was a great review. First review yeah. I ever got was a five-star review. I'm like, okay. But then I had this other woman who read this who was expecting this rock star romance. And it's not that. It's a train wreck of a man who is an addict. But anyway, she writes, this is very strange. I can't believe I read this. She gives me three stars. She's like, I hated the book. And I'm like, you know what, though? You hated it, but I still got some emotion out of you. So therefore, I did my job. So I re-released the book with a different cover and proper edits. She reads it again. I'm like, (laughs) why did you buy it again? (laughs) Tell me, please. (laughs) But that's the thing. Even though she hated it, it's like you still, that review still made you feel something. And And that's as a creator, that's what we're trying to do, is it not? Yeah. Yeah, reviews are funny. Before uh, the film even was released on DVD, I got a review review from a guy. One star, uh, what did he say? A totally useless and worthless film, not worth your time. (laughs) I'm like, what is this guy doing? Going out and giving horrible reviews to movies that have not even been released yet. I've seen an author get a review because the person didn't like the genre she wrote in. Didn't read the book. Admitted she didn't read the book, but didn't like it because of the genre it was written in. It's like, do you have nothing better to say? It sounds more like a a you problem than a me problem. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, do you have nothing better to do with your time than go online and go, oh, I'm going to give you a bad review. Okay. This genre is terrible. (laughs) Okay. Don't know why I read it. But you didn't read it. You even openly said this. So it's just like, okay, whatever. So, and the problem is with reviews, like your guy here, you you have no recourse. You can sit there and go to Amazon or Google and say, look, this wasn't even out. I don't know where this person, well, we can't take it down. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but this is just some. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't care because he obviously has never seen the movie, you know, mm-hmm. so it's like, okay, whatever. Um, I did have uh, some uh, fans of the film uh, swoop in and provide some some good reviews. They'd actually seen it, you know. I think it's at four point two nice. stars. On, nice, on, on, it's a yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's a good movie. I enjoyed it, and it was a nice Sunday afternoon watch. And like I said, you you painted a story. You had these. I like the fact that you had them start out as kids. I did. I liked the fact that you had that that connection from them from the past and this loyalty and and the blood oath that had no blood. But I, I like that. I mean, that was the thing. It was like there was this connection and they're interacting. And even though they drifted apart, they ultimately come back together. Yeah. 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 I, I really enjoyed that. Um, I had something i think you know when when i wrote the script i had something much more sort of grand in in mind you know just in terms of of the adventure that these kids were going to go on um but i just had to tighten it up you know more so you see a lot of that experience that the kids have with the chupacabra you know just through the video um, that the main character watches but um yeah that was also a sort of nod to the goonies and a lot of the you know movies that I loved as a kid about kids, mm-hmm. um, and so I wanted to have that that aspect in it as well. So, if is there anything that we haven't talked about that you would like to add? Um. Well, I I really appreciate um, all of the positive feedback that you have about the film. Mm-hmm. It makes me feel really good. Um, I uh, feel sometimes when I, you know, come on a, a podcast and talk about myself and my film, like uh, what an obnoxious blowhard. But, <laughs> You're fine. But I do feel like I, I made a great movie. You did. Um, and if you, you know, if you like the sort of sci-fi horror comedy genre um, and you enjoy sort of retro comedy, um, you know, raunchy comedy, like this is right up your alley. <laughs> Um, so, you know, seek out the legend of El Chupacabra. Um, I think that you'll be entertained. I would agree. Thank you for coming on. Yeah, you bet. It's been a good time. I always say this because it's true. I had an interesting conversation with Rob. And the fact is, 
it made me remember the joy of production when I was doing it. Because there's something magical when you can bring something. And it's not just, I mean, even as a writer, I get to do that. And, and musicians do it too. Anybody that's in the creative arts, we can sit there and create something from nothing, create something and bring it to life. And it's an amazing gift to be able to do that, to be able to take our words, and in his case, take his words and bring it to film. And when you do that and you can see that production, and like he said, sitting in the audience and getting to hear people's reactions, that, that makes you feel something. It makes you know that you connected and that they have an appreciation for your talent and what you could do. But it's not coming from ego because here's the thing. The most important thing about that is he gets to hear their laughter. He gets to know that he brought joy to them to make them happy, to make them laugh, and to spend the afternoon or evening with them. And that is a gift. It's kind of like when people tune in here. And if I, you know, if you kind of laugh at a joke or you end up thinking, well, what the hell is that about? Or you learn something and you never thought of something that way. Then I've done my job as a podcaster because you've learned something. You've con I've connected with you. And when I connect with my guests and I get to talk to them, that's a gift. It's a creative gift because literally we create this podcast from nothing. Every time a guest comes on here, including Rob, I'm like, do you have any questions for me? And they're like, well, like Rob said, tell me a little about what we're doing. And all I say to them is, it's like you and I go to a coffee shop. We sit down, we talk, and wherever the conversation goes, it goes. So we create something from nothing. And I think we do that every day in our life without us even realizing it, even if you're not a creative person. Because when you are having a conversation with somebody and that thought pops in your head and off you go, well, you weren't planning on talking about that, were you? Not in all cases. But sometimes those are the best conversations we can have. And for the creatives out there, embrace the creativity. Embrace where you're wanting to go. As he said, this was a bucket list item. And are you living your life with purpose? Which is kind of off topic, but it's not because I had a conversation recently with somebody. And we talked about life purpose. And she recommended a book. But the interesting thing during this conversation, I thought back to something that my late husband had ta talked about. And that was at the factory or the printing company where my where he worked with his father and his brothers and his brother-in-law, that when somebody would retire from the company, they usually would be gone within six months. His dad lasted, I believe, 10 years because his dad had a purpose. His dad had his wife. His dad had a life that he still wanted to explore. And the problem is sometimes when we don't have that purpose anymore, we get lost. So create that bucket list because even that bucket list gives us a purpose. It gives us something to get up to when we have nothing sometimes. If we know that we have a purpose in this life, it makes our life more important to us because it allows us to chase our dreams, to chase our hopes, and to try and live the best life we can. And I know that was really off from where we were talking about that movie, but when we chase our dreams, we're checking off that bucket list. So on that note, I'd like to thank Rob for coming on the show. I'd like to thank Rich Sai from Third Ear Audio Productions for doing the sound. And I'd like to thank Fast Susie for the intro and the outro music. But most importantly, I'd like to thank you for tuning in. Because you tuning in is why I do this. And it's not that I have tons of followers. I don't. But the people that listen, I do appreciate you. So whenever you're listening, noonie, noon, noony, uh, whenever you're listening, noon, morning, evening, the weekend, whenever you're listening. Thank you for tuning in. And wherever you are, I hope you have a great day and I'll catch you next time. Bye guys. Bye.